，世界的出路在哪里 ？The global economic playing field is being level. It is extremely painful. That voters liked the slogan "Make America Great Again" because they felt that it wasn't great anymore. That I've always regarded the opportunities that you have in life as being virtually unlimited. 一财 Global 评论员对话全球顶级战略家、经济学家，寻找下一个世界推动者。詹姆斯·沃尔芬森是澳大利亚击剑队队长，是卡耐基音乐厅的主席，和马友友同台表演大提琴。同时，他又是华尔街成名的银行家，身家一亿计。而最终，他出现在世界舞台上，连续出任两届世界银行行长，以解决全球贫困问题为己任。What's the relationship between some extreme poor country in Africa and some other very remote place? What's the relation between them and the prosperity of the world? I think the world recognized that if there was to be a peaceful world and if there was to be a more equitable world. That attention had to be given to these countries, and so the work of international institutions, like the World Bank, was to look at those countries, see how they could develop, see how the leadership, particularly, could be developed, see how there could be a responsible method of developing those countries, and make them into places where. There could be opportunity, and where they could share better in the way the world was working. 七十多年前，当二战的烽火还未结束，盟军正在和日本、德国力战。美国总统富兰克林就开始筹划未来的世界金融体系。一九四四年七月，西方主要国家的代表在美国新罕布什尔州布雷顿森林举行会议，确定了世界银行和国际货币基金组织的建立。两者的核心使命是减少人类所承受的苦难，同时控制威胁赋予国家的经济混乱。In your memo, you mentioned that motto of the World Bank is that our dream is a world without poverty.、Mm-hmm. So, do you think with less poverty, our world will be safer? Well, there are two questions.、Uh, first of all, the objective of the World Bank is to deal with the question of poverty. Second thing, I think you have to say is that some of the countries that were not doing well, and I. Talk again of China and India.、Mm-hmm. Despite the fact that they're having political problems, and indeed by mid-century、mm-hmm. they will rank one and two in the world. The United States、mm-hmm. will be three.、Mm-hmm. That's something that, <laughs> with my generation, we were never used to thinking.、Sure. But there is a new generation coming, and by the mid-century, of the thirty top countries, probably. Eighteen to twenty of them will be what were previously developing countries. How do we think the po- the relationship between poverty and terrorism? Do you think the terrorism is the result of poverty or dangerous ideology or <coughs> the combination of both? Look, I think it's、uh, amongst the terrorists that there are today. There are some people that are poor. Yeah. But undoubtedly, the leadership has been from people that are richer. And I think what happened with the People that joined the terrorist groups is that it gave them a sense of authority,、mm-hmm. a sense of feeling powerful, and I think, as we've seen with Western countries trying to come in and eradicate these people, it's being hard to do. <laughs> We're seeing some difficulties. 这里是九幺幺纪念堂。在九一一恐怖袭击数天后。罗尔芬森就发表演讲说：“没有墙能隔开贫穷和富裕。我们有贸易、投资、金融联系在一起，而疾病、罪恶、移民、毒品、环境恶化、金融危机和恐怖主义也将我们连在一起。”实际上，早在上世纪四十年代，布雷顿森林体系成立之初，代表们就在宣言中明确，每一个国家的经济是否能健康运行，其邻国无论远近都会有所关注。沃尔芬森对二十一世纪恐怖主义的回应是：没有墙能阻止世界的沟通，而这正是弗兰克林·罗斯福创建世界银行的初衷。呃、uh, ，After September 11, you make a speech. You said there is no war separate rich and poor. So, but here we are. President Trump, actually, part of the reason President Trump got elected because he's promising to build a wall. 
So how did you see that? Do you think the war will solve the problem? If he has a wall between here and Mexico, he can keep out undesirables who are coming in from Mexico. The truth is today that uh, more Mexicans are going back than are coming here. <laughs> so whether you need the wall is another question. Um, I think the question of when you have people that are earning less than they're earning in this country, there is always a, um, a reason to come here. But President Trump wants to try and have a border wall. Um, I wish him luck. I think there are many other things that are more important. Wolfson himself's life is constantly breaking through all kinds of walls. Born in Sierra Leone, he grew up in a middle class family. His father, although very wealthy, had a small business that was managed by a middle class banker. His mother was a singer. 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 望子成龙的父亲把自己未完成的希望都寄托在他身上。小学时连跳两级，作为明星学生加入新力男子高中。但是父母过高的期望让少年聪明的沃尔芬森不堪重负。四年后高中毕业时成绩极差，勉强考入大学。大学一年级时所有的考试都不及格。I know in your high school or first year of college, you are, you were not that popular, right? First of all, I wasn't very popular because I was very young. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I went at 15, and uh, to be quite honest, none of the girls looked at me at 15. <laughs> <laughs> they were always looking at these yeah. older men of 17, yeah. 18. So I was, I was a little bit out of the social scene. Yeah. I went every day to the student union and read the newspaper and played chess. Um, I didn't even go to class. So my first year was a disaster. In college? Yeah, disaster. And... Um, then, uh, then I took a job in uh, a timber yard, and the guys in the timber yard said, "Look, you're not strong enough to, to do the work." <laughs> and they got me a job uh, in a department store, and then they said to me that I was a fool doing what I was doing, and I had to report to them every month. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't do well, they would beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> in my second year, they kept on me, and. Uh, things started to change. How do you find your confidence? They built my confidence. Okay. They really did. I couldn't talk to anybody about them because nobody knew them, <laughs> but they okay. were my friends. Okay. And so I'd go and have a beer with them and we'd talk about things and uh, I found it very, very, very helpful in my own development that these were guys who were having difficulty themselves in expanding yes. their own interests. Uh, but they were interested enough to talk to me about how, as a student, uh, I should change things. And it was a great uh, educational process for me. A chance to meet the university in high school, Wolfson met the sport and began to love this sport. Five years later, Wolfson, as a member of the Australian Sport Team, participated in the 1956 Olympic Games. For two years, he became the Sport Team of Australia. And then, the fencing. Well, I did a number of things at the same time. I've yeah. I managed to get into the Olympic team and I became an officer in the Air Force mm -hmm. and all sorts of things happened, um, which made me feel much better about myself. What do you learn from fencing? Oh, you learn a lot about <coughs> strategy, tactics, uh, and most importantly, you learn about self-restraint. It's not a sport that you, that you just rush in and try and hit somebody with whatever you're using. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a very mental sport, so I enjoyed that. Does fencing also help you, help you find your position in the world? Well, I think it was one thing to be an Olympian, and yeah. uh, I suppose in that sense, uh, whenever I say I was an Olympian, people think that's pretty good. Uh, less and less, except that now it's over 60 years ago. So when I talk about it, I can exaggerate because all my team members are dead. <laughs> So I now have a very distinguished career of six years. After the Olympic Games, he was awarded a gold medal. Wolfson was selected to the Harvard Business School. After that, he went to Sydney, London, and Harvard University to develop his career. In the 70s, the three biggest automobile manufacturers in the world were under threat from the Chrysler Corporation. He was working with the investment firm of Wolfson Solomon Brothers to complete the debt. Wolfson successfully solved the task of the impossible task of the Chrysler Corporation, leading to his demise. He was also awarded the Harvard Business School. 一九八一年，沃尔芬森和当年的同事 Bloomberg 一起被所罗门兄弟解雇，也因此得到了一千万美金，开创自己的公司。
。到九十年代，沃尔芬森取得了不可思议的成功，自己开的投资银行 James Wolfson Inc. 将金融界巨匠、威望卓著的前美联储主席 Paul Walker 都收罗旗下。How much of your success you contribute to the intelligent use of circumstances? Well, I think I've been. I think I've lived in a very interesting time. Where a lot more opportunities opened up to people, I don't think you needed to be the son of a rich person who inherited every opportunity. I came to New York at a time when things were changing, and the one thing I found about New York was that when you came to a particular job, I found very little, um, very little distinction in who you were.、Mm -hmm. You were asked to do things.、Uh, I remember I did the first thing I did was to try and save the customs house here, and David Rockefeller was then chairman of it, and I saw him and he said, "Well, you become chairman, and then I'll put together a board,、mm -hmm. and we'll meet in three weeks' time." And he then put together a board which was seven or eight of the top people in New York. I'd never met them before, and we then went and had a meeting, and、uh, for about two years I I did that job. I was amazed that、um, I could get into a job in New York, where I didn't know everybody, where I wasn't part、mm -hmm. of their clubs, but what they were interested in was a particular function, and this was sufficiently unimportant that I could run it. And、uh, we did that, and then from that emerged many other things. And I know you play cello. I play the cello. I do all sorts of things. Yes.、Yeah, so. But I've always regarded. Uh, the opportunities that you have in life as being virtually unlimited. Wolfson is also the Carnegie Hall Music Director. At 40 years old, he was the first famous pianist Jacqueline Dupre. He was Jacqueline's first student. And at that time, Jacqueline asked him to play a music at his 50th birthday at Carnegie Hall Music Festival. Wolfson did it. Later, at his 60th and 70th birthday, Wolfson also played a music festival at Carnegie Hall Music Festival. At the same time, he played with the most famous musicians of the world, including Mario and Yoko. So you are the first student of Jacqueline Dupre. Yes, she was arguably the best cellist of this generation. The famous pianist Jacqueline Dupre is Wolfson's close friend. In the presence of the fact that Jacqueline was only 26 years old, she had a rare form of cancer that prevented her playing. 沃尔芬森建议杰克林可以教人授琴，杰克林便主动提出要教授沃尔芬森，条件是沃尔芬森要在五十岁生日时在卡内基音乐厅表演。Are you the first student? Yeah,、uh, and so I bought a cello and went along to see her. And、uh, before she would teach me, she said, "I want you to know that if I teach you, you have to practice. And、uh, on your fiftieth birthday, you're going to give a concert." <laughs> In Carnegie Hall. At Carnegie Hall, and I said I, I agreed to it because I thought she was mad. <laughs> and、uh, on my 49th birthday, Daniel said to me,、um, "Are you ready for the concert?" And I said, "What concert?" <laughs> he said, "You're doing one at Carnegie Hall." And I said, "You're crazy." He said, "No, he'd got a number of people to play with us, like Isaac Stern and Itzhak Perlman and many great people." He said, "We have a program for you," and、uh, I said, "Daniel, this is only a year away." He said, "Well, you've got a year to prepare," <laughs> <laughs> and so I spent that year practicing, and then we gave a concert. 一九九五年五月，为了表彰她对艺术的贡献，英国女皇伊丽莎白二世授予她名誉爵士爵位。That's so great, you know. But you also work very, very hard, you know. I know you putting forty hours into your firm and thirty hours in Carnegie Hall. And sometimes you. It wasn't just Carnegie. It was a real. I know, and some <laughs> other interests. Yeah. And sometimes you stay in your office at two a.m. So what drives you so fiercely? I can honestly say it was interest. Okay.、Um, <clears throat> I was amazed that these opportunities would be there,、mm -hmm. and I'd never run Carnegie Hall before. And then I decided that we should rebuild it, and、uh, and the other things I was engaged in, whether it be. At universities or educational institutions or churches or whatever,、um, it was all of great interest to me. 正是这样的激情促使他成为世界银行行长。一九九六年，在接受《金融时报》采访时，他说：“你的对发展问题有激情，我对此激情渐增。这就是我所思所想。我早上起来想着这个，晚上睡觉还是想着这个问题。” 
I went to 35 countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. and when I, was I know the first country you go after you become president of uh, World Bank is Africa. That was? Yeah. Because I thought that Africa was the most important. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed it particularly because I got that feeling and I also saw the wonderful football game <laughs> there was uh, in South Africa. I think perhaps the most important thing that I did then was to convince the people at the bank that it wasn't solved overnight. Mm -hmm. yes. That you couldn't deal with the question of poverty by coming up with a program and then looking six months later to see whether it had happened. Uh, these projects are measured in terms of years. And they're they must, all long term problems. They are long term problems. Yeah. And you must continue the project. Um, in some cases, in, in the history of the World Bank, a number of these projects were started, and then when the president changed or managers mm -hmm. changed, they just dropped that project and went on to another one. And that was tremendously wasteful. You needed to, you need a certain time to get these into maturity. Sure. so that you can achieve what you want to achieve. So in the past two decades, millions of people were lived out of poverty because of globalization. But now the anti-globalization sentiment in the developed world spill over to the whole world stage. So do you think it should still show to us that there is a limit for the international economic interdependence? Well, let me start by saying that there will always be people who think that by giving an opportunity to others, what is diminishing the opportunity that they have at home. Mm -hmm. And so there will always be an inner group that will want to pour cold water yes. on efforts to try and improve the lot of people who don't have very much. Yeah. That this is a world which is going to be shared. And the numbers reflect that in terms of economics, in terms of opportunities in terms of the people that do research. Um, all that is changing. There was a time when scientific research was done in the United States and Europe. Yes. It's no longer the case. Um, much of it is done in China. You find mm -hmm. the world is becoming very much more diversified. And much more in integrated, anti-globalization sentiment. Anti-globalization? Yes. Are you worried about that? I'm personally not worried about that. <laughs> I think that there will be a number of people always who will say if jobs are going overseas yes. or if they're being competitive, yes. we're being disadvantaged and we need to do something about that rather than compete. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that, in my opinion, that is the sort of thing which is normal in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, for my working lifetime, it's always been that uh, uh, new manufacturing facilities are going to places where the cost of labor is less. Yes. <clears throat> and so I think you'll continue to have this backwards and forwards. But my experience is that up to now, they're the sort of imbalances mm -hmm. that correct themselves. And if you try and interfere, uh, Generally, my experience is that it's more trouble than it's worth. But still, right now, the populist, you know, seems attract so many people in America. You know, we have Trump as president now. And also in UK, you know, UK exits the European Union. So why do you think the populist attract so many people in the developed world? But I think the thing that you have to say is that in the world at the moment, the numbers are dictating the way the world is moving. What and I mean? well, the OECD countries mm -hmm. who had 80% of global GDP until the end of the last century, just before the year 2000, um, they have not kept up in terms of population. Mm -hmm. They've not kept up in terms of leadership, in terms of science and so on. And since the turn of the century, we're seeing many new things established by the new countries. Sure. China is starting a new investment bank. Yes. Um, that's not a trivial exercise. Yeah. Do you think AIB will be a competitor with World Bank in yes, the world of, of development? And it's stated that it will. And there are a number of people now working for AIB mm -hmm. that 
six months ago working for the World Bank. Okay. And I have no doubt that within five years they will be an effective competitor. Do you think it's a good thing or bad thing? I do. I think it's a good thing because if you if you accept that there are going to be different centers of power in the world, mm -hmm. which I accept, then the fact that they develop institutions that can deal with global responsibilities is very important. And uh, I think that the AIB is being very careful in the way it is announcing its objectives, um, and it very much includes in it the development of developing countries. I think the AIIB is handling itself very well. AIIB promised to have the loan by 2020 about $20 billion, compared to World Bank's $30 billion. It's not much less. Well, that's in a year. Yeah. And um, 20 and $30 billion in terms of world development mm -hmm. together is very small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they have to be there for a while to bring about the change in the countries. Do you think the AIIB is a challenge to Bretton Woods system? Uh, yes, well, in the sense that Bretton Woods had it mostly to itself, mm -hmm. and now you have an effective competitor. Yes. Personally, I think it's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. It may force the World Bank and other international mm -hmm. banks to sharpen up their game. I think that this is a period of enormous change. What I worry about is that <clears throat> in this period of enormous change, uh, that it will go on more or less peacefully. Yeah. I think the world could still be shaken up by a change in uh, the environment of a peaceful development to one which is conflicting. We have at the moment the issue of North Korea. Yes. Hopefully that will resolve itself. But there are many spots around the world where there are, where there is fighting, where there are problems. You have in the Middle East today some problems. Uh, in Africa you have some problems. And I think that all this is going to emerge in the next decades and the world will take a different view about the value of life, the development of the value of development. And respond to the change. Like President Trump want to pick, want to put American interest f first. Do you think is he applying a short-term political solution to a long-term economic problem? Well, I I have to speak of my own view yeah, about of President Trump, yeah. but I think at the moment, <laughs> in what he has said, his statements have all related to the short term. Mm -hmm how he wants to fix the United States, how he wants to make sure that we give less uh, to a lot of the places the that we are now giving to. Yeah. It seems very interesting. Well, President Trump put American interest first. President Xi portrayed China as a champion of the free trade. So how did you see the divergence of US and China? Look, I think President Xi has really articulated a very appropriate plan for China, um, both in terms of manufacturing, in terms of trade, <coughs> and in terms of establishing China's interests around the world by investment. Mm -hmm. So the position, the relative position of China has increased tremendously. I think what we're seeing at the moment is a recalibration of the use of assets. Mm -hmm. And while the world is recognizing legal constraints, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it may not.